sitting in the back, waiting for the talk to end so that I could go and play around. So it's a, lot, it's a big change kind of standing on the other side of the podium for the first time. So thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to sort of share with you what I've been doing for the past five years in Singapore. And this has been a journey through which I've been able to do lots of really cool things. And uh, I really can't wait to share this with everyone. So about five years ago, I was faced with the dilemma that everyone in my age faces. Do I become a doctor? Do I become an engineer? Do I become a lawyer, a journalist? But as I was growing up, my life was filled with books. And like a book like this one uh, called What Mad Pursued by Frank Fitz Crick. We figure out some amazing, beautiful truth about the brain or about, about nature. And so I was the happiest person in the world where instead of all the dreams about pursuing an MBBS or something, I got a call uh, on a scholarship to go to the, to the National University of Singapore uh, for four years. So the moment I got there, I really wanted to do research and I really wanted to explore something. And what I really wanted to explore was, was, was this organ here. And all of you are familiar with it, um, once again that I was really enamored by. And he stated that there is no scientific study more vital to man than the study of his own brain, because our entire view of our universe depends on it. And these are deep words that carry a lot of meaning. And what makes the brain unique is that, unlike any other organ in the body, to understand it, you need to look at it from so many different perspectives. Uh, so the brain is, is a case where you need to know the mathematics behind what brain cells are doing. You need to know the biology behind the brain cell. You've got to understand the physics behind how these cells communicate. And so as a first year undergrad, I was so excited by this so that I wouldn't be leaving all the sciences I loved in school. I could do all of them. I could really engage in doing mathematics, doing biology, doing physics. And I was super excited by that. But the problem is, when you, teach, when you talk to people who work on the brain and you ask them what the brain does, they give you these very fluffy answers. So they tell you that, oh, we have parts of the brain, like the front part, which does decision making. And we have parts of the brain which store memory. But it's almost like a case like this. Like, what is it really doing? We, we keep telling people that you, you, you know, you're taking vision, you have all the sound you're taking in right now, you're hearing me speak, but there's something that happens in the center and you have all this interesting behavior. People get angry, people have Parkinson's, but that middle part is basically like a huge question mark. So that's what I really wanted to find out. And, and the perspective that I, I look at this is, is a very different one from, from normal biology. And the analogy I want to draw upon here So, so I kind of just listening to it, it sounds very similar to that Morse code, right? There are some dots, there are some pauses, and the reason we understand the Morse code is because we know what the dots and dashes mean. But in the brain, we don't know what any of that means, and that becomes a challenge. How do you find out the code for the brain? And that's been kind of the mystery that everyone's been working on for, for a long time now. And a particular mystery that's, that's extremely interesting that I found in my, in my second year was the mystery of Parkinson's disease. So, what, so compared to like any other disorder, let's say like any mental disorder like schizophrenia, where we know basically almost nothing, in Parkinson's disease we know quite a lot. For example, if we compare the healthy brain and the so-called so Parkinson's disease brain, you can see that obviously there's this kind of red portion that's missing on the other side. So what happens is that you have a single brain region that dies off over time, but we don't know what that brain region even does. And what this happens to be the case because in, in a lot of biology we keep assuming that all cells are kind of the same, and that's really not true. So when you try delivering drugs to, for example, for treating Parkinson's, all the cells kind of get affected the same way. But what if some cells are different? And this was, this was a quest we kind of went on, and what we discovered ultimately in that process was an entirely new kind of brain cell that people had never really described before. And it, it looks different from other brain cells, it talks differently from other brain cells, and we were excited that we found this new thing, but what was it really doing in Parkinson's disease? And that's something we couldn't really answer in Singapore. And so we kind of went over a little bit to Sweden. And, and that was an amazing journey on its own. So in Sweden, there was this place called the Karolinska Institute. And what makes Karolinska unique is that this is the home of the Nobel Prize. So every year, the faculty of the Karolinska Institute come together and they decide who wins the Nobel Prize in medicine. And that's like a remarkable thing to see as like a science nerd, because you see all these famous, important people come together. And that day, a Nobel Prize winner is born. So it's this really amazing moment to just see, really. And in, at, at the Karolinska Institute, there was kind of a revolution. A revolution that really changed how all of neuroscience is done today. And what it's allowed us to do was to really control the brain using light. And I'm gonna show you an example of how that works. Is that you have a mouse over here. And what makes the mouse unique is that, I'm just gonna pause it now. If you've noticed, the mouse moves really slowly. And if you look closely at its body, it's really trembling a lot. And this is exactly what happens in Parkinson's disease. You really can't move so much, you have these tremors, you have a problem with your gait, you really can't focus, you're not really alert. And what, what we're gonna do now 
is we're going to use light. We're going to just turn on blue light inside the mouse's brain, and you'll see something remarkable happen. So the mouse is not alert, it's confused, it's walking really slowly, and the light comes on, and the mouse becomes super alert. Its movements are faster. It knows what it's looking for. It's, it's searching the environment. And, and this technology has been extremely revolutionary. You can basically control the brain using simple light. And, and think about it, you can almost turn on and off Parkinson's disease right now. And, and these kind of things are what or people are using in clinics these days, or rather in clinical trials these days, to really understand whether or not we can control things like Parkinson's. Well, we've tackled things like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's in, in our lab in Singapore. The challenge remains that we know almost nothing about mental disorders. Because if you think about it, things like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, we should, we should consider these things to be people to be crazy less than even 10, 15 years ago if people had these disorders. But we recognize them to be something much more today. They are actually disorders of the brain. And uh, at, at CalSec, for example, we have a group that works on something quite remarkable in that they found, for example, a switch for aggression. So I'm going to show you an even more remarkable video now where we can turn on aggression in an animal using light. So what you're going to see now first is two, they're going to see two different mice. They're absolutely fine. They're not doing anything to each other. So perfectly happy mice. Light comes on and they start attacking each other vigorously. And they keep attacking each other. You can see the helpless mouse on the other end just trying to escape and run away. And you have this mouse with the light on. Like it can't, you've pretty much made it only attack things now. And you'll see something more remarkable that when the light turns off, it just goes back to normal, like nothing ever happened. It's almost like you're controlling your mind using this technique. It's a really, really remarkable and really powerful tool in, 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 the, in the brain now. You can see the light's off and the mouse is fine. Like nothing ever happened, you know. So, so this, is, this is a really, really remarkable technique that we're using all over the world now. And, uh, and, and that's kind of the message I want to I wanna kind of end with, in that while the, while the brain is complex and while there's so many things we don't know, we, we definitely don't know, it, over the past about 10 years or so, we made some great strides in understanding diseases, understanding the basic brain, controlling emotions, controlling memory, and so much more. So there's a lot of really cool things to be done, and over the next five years I can't wait to come back and tell you all about it. So yeah, so that's about that, and I uh, hope you guys like the talk. <laughs>